Well, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Praise Amen. the Lord. We're glad to have all of you tuned in with us tonight. And we believe that God has something real special prepared for you. We know that you won't leave the same. You're going to be changed positively for the Lord yes. and uh, it'll make you happy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You know, here we are in the middle of the week, you know, being Wednesday and a lot of times, you know, we've made it to there and I believe God is going to do something tonight to take us on into the week for Thursday, Friday and the weekend and just minister by his spirit and build us up in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, you can be seated, everybody. Good to be in church. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Praise God. Hope you've had uh, up to this time a good week. If you haven't, there's still hope. It's not over yet. Amen. Praise God. We're going to continue to worship the Lord with our giving. It, it being our regular church service here at Redemption, we always receive an offering. And I know a lot of you online, uh, we, of course, don't put any pressure on you to do anything, but we appreciate you when you do. And uh, there's a way there on the screen that'll tell you what to do and how to go about that. Uh, if you want to explain that a little bit? Well, you can give online, you can give through text, or you can mail in a gift to the church if you'd like to do that. And we do appreciate what everybody does to mm -hmm. help us take this word of God and go forward. And really, we're partners together in Christ, and that's a good, good thing. Amen, it sure is. So we're going to pray over the offering. We'll pray over the word and get going. Father, we want to thank you for the wonderful opportunity that we have to give to you and to worship you with our giving. Lord, giving is a, a very, very... Um, sacred thing that we we do from the bible uh, you told us to present our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto you and so lord everything that goes into what was required to attain that money whether it be the mental capability whether it be the time whether it be the education everything that it took to make that happen, we ask you to bless that because that's what's being sanctified. It's not the money. Because when we give money, we're not giving just money. We're giving ourselves. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can do that and worship you with our giving. And so as we approach your word, we ask you to bless its going forth. We invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, yes. the, the, the great teacher of the church. And so, Father, we thank you for uh, a mouth to speak, we thank you for ears to hear, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, Nor and I, we, we've got some things we want to talk to you tonight about, and I, th I think it'll bless you. I think it'll help you. Uh, it, I know when I first begin to be acquainted with uh, this topic, we're going to talk to you about the believer's authority. And when I first began to be acquainted with it, uh, this been many, not just years ago, but now decades ago, it was such a new and a fresh revelation to me that uh, I thought, where's this been all my, all my whole life? Really? I, didn't, I didn't know we had any authority. Uh, I thought, you know, you get saved and you endure to the end and, you know, go to heaven. But anything between here and there, I didn't think there was much say so we had. We're, we, it was all in God's hands. And one of the reasons that we come to those conclusions is because there's a, I think a misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God. We've talked about that some even here on our Wednesday night sessions, but the sovereignty of God basically says something along this line. Well, you, you don't have any say so God in his sovereign will, he just, uh, you know, he just does it all. And, and you, you really don't have anything to do with it. You're just here along for the ride. That's, there's nothing been any further from the truth than that. Um, now, God is sovereign, but he's, there are limits to God's sovereignty. Now, what do I mean when I say limits? Because some people, I mean, right there, you, you right, right at that moment in time, that thing right there, what I just said, is outside their box already. Because God can't do anything and everything he wants to do. We know that God is not a man that he should lie, so he can't do everything. There's no variables or shadow of turning in him, so he can't change. So there's certain things that God can't do. Now, in the sovereignty of God, God has given us 
um, a book called the Bible, which is made up of two covenants. It's made up of what we call, now there's more, more than the two covenants in here. But the two primary covenants that we have anything to do, the redemptive covenants or the covenant that God made with Abraham. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't come to, to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. That's what Jesus said about the Abrahamic covenant. And then we have, in addition to that, we have what we call the new covenant. Now, we have written on the back of our Bibles, many of you have uh, something that says the New and Old Testament. Now, the word testament is, is the word for covenant. And, uh, and the concept of, of covenant is the basis of everything. Now, what covenant basically means is that you enter into an agreement. You can make a covenant. I mean, when the, the Bible says that... Um, He's witness to the covenant made at our marriage vows. And so when you enter into marriage, you enter into covenant. And so there's a lot of things that we do that are covenant related that often we don't even think about. We just think, well, that's an agreement or something like that. You, uh, you know, in your own, uh, possibly where you live, you're maybe a homeowner's associate or, some, or something of that nature. It may be called something else where you live. But there's an organization that, that, has certain covenants that when you live there that you have to keep. You have to maintain maybe certain property uh, restrictions. You, maybe you can't build certain things because it would violate the covenants of that neighborhood. They don't want you to build a chicken coop right outside on the front lawn. You know, there are certain things that you're not supposed to do. And so that's a covenant that you have with your neighbors, and it's for your protection and it's for their protection so that you don't have somebody that just would do anything and everything. So we enter into covenants quite often and don't really think about it as covenant, but a covenant, a covenant is simply an agreement, and it has a legal aspect to it. Now, when you entered into covenant with God, you entered into a legal covenant. Now, you don't think about it necessarily as legal because it's spiritual. The forgiveness of sin is, uh, is something that we enjoy because of what? Christ did at Calvary and all that whole process that led up to that. But you don't necessarily think about it as a covenant, but God does, and we should, because a covenant is an agreement of which there is no alteration of it. You can't alter it. You can't change it. It is binding. It is legal. And there's certain things even about prayer. Prayer is legal. You have a legal right to answer prayer. Well, now, I don't know if that's true. I guarantee it's true. And if you don't think that way, then why would you even pray? He said, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. Well, what's his will? His testament, will and testament. See, God will answer your prayer if you pray according to the covenant. It's not a, it's not a question whether he'll answer it. The question is really not will he answer it. The question is will you believe he'll answer it? That's the question. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And if you, if you don't operate in faith, you won't get it. The, the, the Bible says the word did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them and heard it. If you don't put any faith in your prayers, it's not going ha to happen. So you have to believe it. And so there's that legal documentation that God has given us in his word that tells us he will do certain things for us. And so... Uh, to question it is really, um, well, it's unbelief for one thing, but it's bad taste. It, it, it's rude. If Nora told me that, you know, when we leave here tonight, we're going to go do something, and she made a, uh, she told me this is what we're going to go do, um, well, I'd believe that. Why would I not believe that? Because I believe her. I trust her. I trust her word. I trust what she says, and there would be no reason I would not believe that. Well, it's the same way with God. If he tells you he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Now, God has given us parameters by which and from which and of which he works. He says, I will do this for you if you do this for me. Now, what were the parameters for salvation? You had to ask Jesus into your heart. You had to believe that he was raised from the dead. You had to do certain things along those lines. 
You had to confess him with your mouth. If you do that, then what did he say you do? Thou shalt be saved. Well, I prayed that and it didn't happen. No, you prayed that and you didn't believe it. Therefore, that's why it didn't happen. If you believe it, it happens. You got to believe it. So God has limited himself to this book. He doesn't work outside it. He, he doesn't come with strange new things to every individual or every new person that comes up. The Bible says even Satan in his temptations that he uses against us, and he does tempt us to do things. The Bible says that there, there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. He doesn't have a new drawer over here to go open and pull a new trick on you. He's got limits to what he can do. He can't, he can't go get a new set of rules to play ball with you. He has to stay inside the parameters. Now, if we understand that the sovereignty of God, and these are choices that he made, these are not choices that we made. The sovereignty of God is limited and contained by what he said. He, he made himself understandable to us. He made himself available to us. He made himself predictable to us. There are people who say, well, you just never know what God might do. Well, they don't know the scripture. You know exactly what God will do if you understand what the book says. You know exactly what he'll do. But the reason that people don't know what God will do is because they don't know their covenant. The Bible says that people live their whole life subject to bondage because they were strangers from the covenant. They didn't, they didn't know it. So when we talk about the authority of the believer, you have to talk about the fact that God himself is the one that limited himself to what he will and won't do, what he can and can't do. And so the sovereignty of God is not just God can do anything he wants to do any old time he wants to do it. It, it. It's not that way. As a matter of fact, the will of man is stronger than the power of God. You say, well, I don't think I believe that. Well, he won't violate your will. He won't make you do anything. He won't make you choose him. He won't make you get filled with the spirit. He won't make you believe him. He won't make you read the Bible. He won't make you pray. He won't make you do any of it. So the will of man, at least as it's related to you, is stronger than the power of God. But in reality, we know that's not actual. God is more powerful than a man. We know that in reality. So he intentionally limited himself. He restrained himself for the purpose of you understanding him, the purpose of you knowing him, the, for the purpose of him being predictable to you, believable to you. God is vast. And the only thing that we know about him is what he lets us know. You don't know him apart from him letting you know him. So he reveals himself. That's what revelation is. It's the revelation of God. And God reveals himself in certain ways. And he reveals himself through scripture. He will, he will reveal himself some circumstantially he does to different people in different ways now that doesn't mean he's changeable as it relates to covenant but it does mean that he's unique in how he deals with every person there's a unique calling on your life that's different than the one on my life and so he reveals himself in consistency with the call and the anointing and the grace that's on your life definitely and you know eddie this is such an important subject about the believer's authority. I remember it's been years and years ago now that I did not know this. And I didn't know that if I prayed that I could receive from the Lord. I, I did not know that. I just kind of thought it was just throw it up and hopefully that prayer will, something will happen. Yeah. But I, I had no idea. I didn't know that God wanted to bless and favor my life. I had no idea. Now, I, I wasn't a pessimistic person. I'm, you know, usually pretty upbeat and um, positive. Uh, but I just didn't know these things. And because I didn't know it, I had no victory. 
And then I started uh, hearing about this right. authority and right. people preaching on the Word of God that shows us what we have. And I'm telling you, my life was turned upside down in a good way because the things that I was uh, just ignorant about, I had no idea that God wanted to do certain things in me and even through me. I had no idea. I just thought, you know, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm going to, you know, live my life in this earth and hopefully I can make a difference. But I had no assurance that I could make a difference. And then when I began to see these things and see what God has given to the believer. And if you know Jesus Christ, right. you're a believer. You are a Christian. You're one of God's children. And so you have rights and privileges that the Bible talks about that you may be just like where I was. Or maybe, you know, I know sometimes, Eddie, people know. They, they've been acquainted with the truth, but they don't really practice it. Well, that doesn't do you. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. It, it's not what you heard. It's what you're hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And that is very important. Not what I, I mean, I can still maintain and hold on to the truths that I've learned over the years. But I'm going to tell you, you have to keep these promises before you, lest you let them slip. And so that's why I feel like doing these things like we're going to talk about tonight right. is, is imperative to our growth and to our movement forward in the Lord. It's very important. Well, you, you see a progressive revelation of the authority that Jesus gave to his people. You find in Luke chapter 9 in verse number 1, and he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick now that's the 12 we know that those 12 at this time were disciples they would be apostles the only one that didn't make it was Judas who betrayed him but he had a replacement you find in Acts 1 and so here Jesus gave to those 12 not just uh any old authority, he gave them power over, over the works of darkness. He said over the devil and to cure diseases and all those things. Now, the interesting thing about this is, well, before, before we make the move to the next scripture, I want to point out this difference here. He gave them power and authority, and they are, they're different. Power and authority are different. Authority is what you have. Um, it's, it's maybe like a, a good way to say it would be like a family, family name or something like that. You, you have authority because you're born into a, a certain household. That, that family name, that family crest, if you will, it gives you a certain status in certain areas. So you have an authority. But now the word power is a different word. And Jesus told us in Acts 1, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto, unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So authority is um, what you have. There's a number of ways you get it. One is by inheritance. And that's... Well, okay, let's delve there just a little bit. Inheritance is what happened to you at the new birth. You are born again and you were made a joint heir with Christ. Inheritance. You got an inheritance. But then you can have an inheritance and have no power. Now, what do I mean? Well, the ability to enforce the authority you have is a different thing than having the authority. So when he said you have power and authority, what he's saying is you, you have a, a birthright to authority. The new birth gives you that, that, that inherited, inherited authority. You have it. But that doesn't mean you can carry it out. You, you, may, you may have authority and you may have to have a bodyguard to keep you protected. And so to a degree... 
you may have some power because of the delegated uh, structure of that bodyguard to you. But the bodyguard's the one with the power, not you. You have authority, but he's the one that has the power. You follow what I'm talking about? Now, God says that when you get filled with the Spirit, that now you have the power to enforce the authority that he gave you. And that's a real important thing. And the power that you get at, at this infilling of the Holy Spirit is, is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, where it talks about these nine gifts of the Spirit that are given to enforce the authority that you have. These are power gifts. These are things that are given for reasons. Let's just take a peek at that a minute. It would be a good idea, don't you think? Mm -hmm. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, these will be familiar to some of you, maybe some of you not at all, I don't know. But um, it tells us here, there's so many things, there's so much you could say from this. Um, I want to start at verse 1, really is what I want to do. But we'll go to verse 8 for time. It says, For the one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another, the working of miracles to another prophecy to another the discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now these are the manifestations of the spirit used in the life of a believer to enforce their authority. You not only have authority, but now you have power given to you supernaturally by God to enforce that authority. Yeah. It's one thing to know that God is a healer. It's another thing to be used by God for healing. And he said one of the gifts here is healing. You follow what I'm saying? So we get, we get born again and we have authority, but then we get filled with the Spirit. Now we have power, power to enforce that inheritance that we have. And those are the ways right there mentioned in that passage of Scripture. And so he gives us authority and power to cure diseases. And now this is the 12, of course. But then you see just a, a page over in chapter number 10. He said, and after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. And so um, they came back in verse 17. Now this is the same group. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So see, they had, they had not just authority, but they had power. They had the power to deal with the enemy, the devil, defeat him. And so here we find in the progression of how God began to unfold his authority was the first, the 12, then the 70. And then you come over here in, in Mark chapter 16. And uh, this is real important. This is just before Jesus ascended to heaven. He's leaving the earth. He's given his final words. I'd say that's pretty important, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Yeah. And we see in verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the 11, as they said, now the 11 is, you know, Jesus was not a part of the 12, so it's now down to 11. And upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world. Now that's pretty much what he said to the 12 and pretty much again what he said to the 70. And so in this progressive revelation of God, now he's talking to the church. And he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Now, now just for the record, those of you that, that maybe don't believe you should speak in tongues, that was the Lord Jesus that said that. It wasn't a Pentecostal doctrine. 
That was the Lord Jesus, head of the church, the crucified Lamb of God that said that. So if you got an argument with that, take it right there before you get too argumentative. Take it up with the one who said it, all right? And uh, they shall take up serpents, and drink. if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So the things that he told them to do is they went and did that. He confirmed that word with the sign following. Now, people get hung up on this taking up serpents and, and drinking any deadly thing, and they get, you know, that, that, and some bad stuff has come out of that. But now, everything that's mentioned right here, you find in other places in Scripture. Now, what do I mean? Um, you remember Paul when he was shipwrecked, and they were on uh, the Isle of Melita, and, and you know, a, a serpent is a is a cold-blooded animal and if it's cold they get stiff they won't move they 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 just you know uh retreat back away you know and and when warmth comes they begin to be active well here they had taken sticks and they were building a fire because they were cold and as they put those sticks on that fire one of those venomous uh, snakes was in that pile of wood and they evidently didn't know it. And so as the, as the fire began to, to build up, that snake got active and it bit Paul and Paul shook it off in the fire and it didn't even hurt him. Now it didn't say take up, take up serpents as a, as a church ritual, but we do have evidence in scripture that we, we know that a person was bit by a serpent and it didn't hurt him. We know that. So you can establish that. And I don't think it's a, a thing that I don't think we ought to be handling snakes in church. I just don't. So get that straight. Okay. <laughs> At least not my church. <laughs> At least not while I'm there. I guarantee you. <laughs> because we'd be leaving now. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the point is, is not trying to build a doctrine here, but understanding the truth in it that the power and authority that God's given us. And then when you see this, if you drink any deadly thing, it'll not hurt you. Well, he said that your food and your, and you know, what you're going to consume is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That's what sanctifies it for the purpose of use. And I don't think it's tempting God with drinking something deadly to show your faith. I don't think that's what he meant at all. I think if somehow you got something accidentally that you maybe didn't know, and, and I think all of us probably have had some form of food poison. I mean, you get certain things that just don't agree with you. And uh, God said he'd heal you from it. That's what I'm getting at. So, so, you know, don't make doctrinal problems here because these are not necessarily problems unless we want to make them problems. You can establish these things in other places in Scripture is what I'm getting at. But the point is, is Jesus, he commissioned the 12, he commissioned the 70, and then just before he, com he left, he commissioned the whole church to go into all the world. And wherever you find the devil, get rid of him. That's right. Wherever Deal you find him, him, get rid of him. Get rid of the devil, wherever you find him. Well, that's what we're talking about, the authority of the believer or the believer's authority. We have authority over the works of darkness. That's right. And, it. you know, it, it, it really took me aback when I began to read the Bible for myself, not just listening to everybody else, but I heard some good teaching, of course, and you should do that. But when I began to read it for myself, it's like, wow. Where I am, they're not casting out any devils. Many times they don't even acknowledge there is a devil. Yeah, don't don't and bring if it up. They, yeah, and <laughs> if they do, up. there's fear uh, related yeah. to, oh, don't make the devil mad. You know, it's like, so 
He, ca he said, cast him out. That, when it says cast him out, it means deal with the devil. It doesn't mean go around looking for devils, yeah. but yeah. it means as you go into the world right, and you exactly. come across exactly. situations and circumstances where these things are going, cast out the devil. Deal with the devil. And how do you do that? Through the name that's above every yeah. name. name that Jesus. powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. And I tell you, the blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ destroyed the power of Satan exactly from right. being able to overwhelm us and take us, you know, uh, uh, to places that we don't want to go. We have power through that name. But, right. but, you know, it's like everything else in the Word of God. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. It's not a test. You're not, not on a trial run. You've got to believe it. And just when you find Him and as you go, Deal with it in your life. Don't, don't let it go on. You know, we've told this story many times, but it's uh, when we started the church, uh, we were in a little rental home, which we had never been in a rental home. You know, we'd always owned whatever we lived in. Um, and so we, uh, we rented this home, and we had some furniture, not a whole lot, and probably wasn't the best, but we had a washer and dryer. And ladies, who doesn't need their washer and dryer? You know, we got to have that. And so I remember that all of our appliances, when we just started the church, maybe, what, six months old or? One month. Yeah. And the washer was torn up. The dryer was torn up. The dishwasher was torn up. All this happened at one time. When you find the devil in your house, deal with the devil. Now, you know. Now, do you, you mean to tell me that you think the devil can make your washing machine quit working? I'll say this: I believe I believe <laughs> oh, okay. things wear out. Okay, I <laughs> right. believe that they do. Uh, you know, so I'm I'm not being ridiculous about it. But when you see something like that, we start the church. We, yeah. we don't and have we didn't a, have any money. No, there wasn't a lot of extra yeah. money. Anything any we money. were doing, you know, we yeah. were trying to, you know, start this church and this work, you know, doing what we do. And uh, so when you see that and everything at the well, same when, time. When you, when you pick up a pattern. Yeah. That, that's the thing. You look, you look at these patterns, and we've done this long enough. You can begin to detect those patterns. Mm -hmm. Now you may you may think that's funny what she says. And I'm I'm saying, you know, almost really ridiculous. You may think we're crazy people. Well, tell the rest of the story. <laughs> well, you know, so I'm like, what is going on? I've got to have this stuff, you know, for my house to run this household. And so I you know, I go to Eddie, you know, he's studying eight hours a day or whatever it is in his study in that And it house. wasn't enough because I didn't know anything. You know? <laughs> it w do what? I said it wasn't enough because I didn't know anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, uh, you know, so I, he said, well, do something. Do something. Well, it's like, well, I'm going to do it. So I went in there and laid my hands on each of those appliances. And you're a witness to it. I, I just said, devil, you get out of this house and off of our property. We're doing this work for the Lord, and oh, you are not going to hinder our home. And I'm telling you, the washer started washing, the dryer started drying right. the clothes, That's and right. that dishwasher, it worked so well when we left that home, uh, I ended up giving that to someone else who was able to use it, and I don't know how long they used it, but, and, and see, I'm not trying to be ridiculous there, because the devil works in so many ways. Yeah, well, and, thing, things do wear out, and, yeah. and not every time you have something, you know, tear up, it's not necessarily a, a devil behind it, yeah. but when you start seeing trends, and you start seeing patterns, the best thing you can do is check up yeah. first. You really should. Because you can spend a whole lot of money and you can't catch up. You can't, you, you, I mean, just the way it is. Mm -hmm. I remember we did a staff outing and uh, there were several of us, I, I don't know, 15 of us, I guess, or so. We went up and got a cabin in the mountains. Oh, yeah. It was a big, big cabin. 
and uh, you know, like three levels chalet, up, you know. And uh, it was when in the winter, and when we got up there, the pipes were froze. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be here for an outing, and the pipes were froze for a few days. Well, they, well, it wasn't frozen a few days for us because no. But I'm saying we got to spend a few days. Yeah, in right, this place. right. But we got up there, and it's like, well, it looks like this outing's over because it was a staff. You know, it was a, a thing that we were doing for the ministry. It was not just, you know, a fun and games time. I mean, we were doing there to do planning and things that related to ministry work. We do have some fun, but I mean, it was, it was a work trip. And you get up there and you think it's over before you start. I mean, you're dead in the water now because you don't, you don't have any water. I mean, the faucets won't work. And, uh, of course, man of faith and power that I am, I said, it looks like we're going to have to leave. You know, and then on the scene comes Superwoman here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know true. about that. But. Well, it, it just seemed to work. But anyway, she said, well, I'm going to go in there and pray over that. I said, well, I mean, it, and it wasn't getting warmer outside. I'm telling you, it is cold. And it's getting colder, too. And so she went in there and prayed over that water faucet. And so help me, I'm telling you, she hadn't got her hands off of it and it started running water. Water started coming. I mean, out. right then. I don't mean, well, you know, half a day later after everything's warmed up. I mean, I'm telling you, it started running right then. And I thought, well, so much for my unbelief. Because I didn't, I didn't think it'd happen. I'm sorry. But, oh, you have little faith, you know. Yeah, I couldn't imagine being there for a couple of days in a place. and. Well, we wouldn't have been there a couple of days. Well, we gonna, probably we'd not. We'd coming back but, to Knoxville. But still, we'd be staying up there. <laughs> we made that trip up there. A lot of, uh -huh. um, you know, a lot of preparation yeah. for us all to get there and, and do the things that yeah. uh, that we needed to do through the planning. And so what a what a waste, you yeah. know. What a waste. Well, and we, and we had, you know, a good trip. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> had to go in, and then you say, "Well, was that the devil?" Well, when you find things that hinder the work of the Lord, I'd be real suspicious, wouldn't you? I mean, because I'm going to tell you, He'll manifest in ways you don't think He will. I mean, He'll do things. I mean, He'll He'll do things that you can't think you you, you don't think He could even do, but He will. And uh, now I know that that could get kooky. I, I do know that. And yeah. I, know, I know that. And I know that people think it's kooky to even talk about it. But it ain't kooky if the water's running. You get what I mean? So call it kooky if you will, but it worked. And, and I'm not saying that every time that something like that happens and you pray over it, if it doesn't happen, I'm not saying that, that you, know, you don't have power or anything like that. Because sometimes it's time stuff does wear out. It's just time to get a new washer or right. whatever it yeah, is, exactly. you know. Uh, so every washer we've ever had, we've never laid hands on it. No. <laughs> you know, it's not been something that we consistently do. But even if you're going on a trip or something like that, and you begin to see a pattern of hindrance in that in your travel plans, just everything from uh, just packing or the routines or all the things related to it. You just begin, everywhere you turn, there's just a hindrance, there's a hindrance, there's a hindrance. And if you know it's the will of God. If it's the will of God. Yeah, if you know it's the will of God that you take the trip, you just better bind it up. Now, I've traveled enough internationally to know this. I'm telling you, you can see things that begin to start. And when you see it begin to start, you better stop it early. Because those things will grow. And it'll get a whole lot worse. If you don't stop it. Well, and I want to mention this. There was one time where you were going to take a trip. Oh, yeah. And you well, more than that. once. But, but do you know the one you're well, talking I'm, about? Well, I'm talking about the one that, that God told you not to do it. Well, it, it, really, it really wasn't exactly like that. It's just, well, look, look over here and I'll show you the principle. Look over here in the book of Acts, chapter 15. 
This, and this will this will paint this picture for you a little bit better. Since we're into this, I didn't know we were going to get into this, but we are. Um, this fifteenth chapter of of Acts is a transitionary chapter in the life of Paul. This is where he took Silas on as his ministry partner and Barnabas went another way. That's what happens in this chapter right here. And uh, there, there were reasons that, that a team had assembled in a certain location to do some ministry. And you look up here in verse 22, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send uh, chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, on and on and on. And Silas was one of them. But now notice what it says here. It says it pleased the apostles and elders. So sometimes we, we want this big, you know, sky-written Holy Spirit message that just, you know, blasts everybody out of their seat, the trumpet of God or something. But sometimes the leading of the Lord is as simple as it pleased them to do it. And so God's got a lot of ways of leading, of leading people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a much, much simpler thing. And that the, the point that I'm making is, is it was a leading from the Lord, what you're talking about, that trip that I was supposed to take. It was a leading from the Lord, but it wasn't like a word from God. It's just I begin to lose the favor that it would to have taken to make the trip. It's just this is too hard. It, it's just it's just not working. You, you have, you're going to have to push this too hard to do it. Now I'm not talking about the the mechanics of it. You can get through that part. I'm talking about in the heart. This 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 is this is not this is not something I think I ought to do. But it wasn't a word. It's just you lose desire for it. You just, I don't want to do it. You follow? Do you follow? And so sometimes we're waiting on this, this great big grand message from God, and the whole time it's that still small voice mm -hmm. right down inside of you. And it's not as complicated sometimes as we think. But now I, I, I know the devil can do some of that too. So you got to push through things if you're going to get anywhere. Yeah. But sometimes it's, it's time to, to, to stop and take a minute. Why do you not want to do it? What, what's, what's changing inside you? What's going on here? Then you go down in verse 25, and it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our brother, uh, our beloved, uh, our, our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Now, the point here is here you see in verse 22, it pleased them. Now here you find in verse 25, it seemed good. Hmm. That's not real complicated, is it? I mean, that's not real hard. I mean, we're waiting. Man, if I could get in so, a certain, certain place, they'd give me a prophecy and I'd know what to do with my life. Well, I'm going to tell you, you might know what to do with your life, but you might get misled. You won't get misled if you follow this. You prove things out. You walk slow enough to let God talk to you. You walk slow enough to let mm. God talk to you. Yeah. You get pushed and shoved and you feel like you've got to do it. You've got to do it right now. You ever gone to buy a car? Well, if you don't buy it today, it's going to be gone. Well, let it be gone. We'll lose it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be forced. The Bible says hasty decisions will ruin you. So you can't be pushed and forced into things, especially as it relates to your life. Something that is, well, you, you better marry them or they'll be gone. Well, bye. <laughs> well, bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> I mean, it's too critical. You know what I'm talking about? You know? So here we have, uh, it pleased them and it seemed good to them. And we go on down. And you find down here at verse number 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. So now we've got a little more going on here. So it pleased them. It seemed good to them. Now it seemed good to them and the Holy Ghost. Hmm. So there's a spiritual witness with this thing going on. Now we're talking about being led here. 
That's what we're talking about here. And see, this was a transitionary event in the life of the Apostle Paul. This was a transitionary event. This was no small thing, what's going on right here. No small thing, you know? And uh, it says, uh, if you go on down, verse 32, And Judas and Silas, uh, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried their space, uh, they were let go in peace from the brethren and to the apostles notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there. In other words, he, it was time to leave. But he didn't want to go. It was time to leave town. It's time to go back home. But he didn't go back home. Why? He just didn't want to go home. Hmm. You mean that could be a leading from God? Well, read on down here and you find. Uh, and it says that after some days, verse 36, uh, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren. And, and there arose a contention because Barnabas, verse uh, 37, it says he was determined to take John Mark, whose surname, uh, John, whose surname was Mark. And Paul thought um, it not good because John Mark had left them in a lurch once before. They got out in a, in a place. Listen, guys, I'm telling you, when you're traveling, especially when you're traveling in the primitive conditions that they had to travel and the places they had to go, you got to depend on the person beside you. Now, I'm going to tell you, you can have all the strategies of war that you want to have. But I'm going to tell you, when you get in combat, real combat, let me tell you who you depend on. It's that person sitting right beside you. It's not general so-and-so, or it's not the commander-in-chief of the of armed forces. It's that person right there. Because if they don't do their job, you probably might die. And it gets right down to that. Well, here Paul, the apostle Paul, is going into all the world and preaching the gospel as Jesus commanded. And he's going into primitive places, and he's going into hostile environments. And you can't do it with... Cowards and people who are unfaithful. It does not work. Your life is on the line with this. It's not a joke. You have to know that person beside you is who they're supposed to be. And you can't wonder if they're going to, you know, get homesick. You're going to have to go with somebody you can trust and rely on. And that's why Paul did not want to take John Mark on that trip. Because there had already been a failure in that capacity. But then Barnabas contended with him. Now remember something about this authority structure. There are higher and lower levels of authority. Paul obviously gave us half the New Testament. Right? He was the higher in authority than Barnabas. It was Barnabas' job to submit to Paul, not Paul's job to submit to Barnabas. Now see, that was, that was a bit of a role reversal because when Paul first got saved and everybody was afraid of him because he'd been out killing Christians, Barnabas was the one that vouched for him. So how, here we have Barnabas initially being the leader, but now the mantle is shifted and now it's on Paul. And Barnabas is going to have to learn how to walk in a second man row to the apostle Paul. I don't know what all the conditions were for Barnabas to be put in a position where he would make such a, what I consider to be a blunder. Because he made a blunder. Because Barnabas walked clean out of the New Testament to never be mentioned once again. Right here. Barnabas, the name Barnabas is not mentioned one more time in New Testament uh, revelation. Not once more. So did he miss it? I'd think. I would think. You judge it. But I would think evidence would prove it. 
That would be my opinion. Now, Barnabas, I'm sure he's in heaven. I'm sure he did a good work. And I'm sure, but he did not have a relationship with Paul at the level necessary to move forward. It ended right here. Okay. Now, and it says, um, verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder and, uh, from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So here's, here's Silas because it pleased him. It seemed good to him. It seemed good to him and the Holy Ghost. And it pleased him to not go back home. I mean, all these things just seemed right. And the next thing you know, he stepped into his destiny right there. So it wasn't, it wasn't you know, a homing pigeon came in and gave him a message from heaven. It wasn't dramatic. It's just being understanding who he is and understanding his walk with God and being comfortable in the position that he's got to make decisions for and not let himself get agitated and get out of the will of God by, by being just forced. Now, this thing that you were talking about that you brought up, this trip that I had, I had, had scheduled, you know, trips like that, you schedule far in advance. Some of them, you know, out a year ahead. And this had been scheduled for months and months and months and months. And you were at that particular time traveling a lot. Yeah, yeah. We're doing three to five meetings a year out of the country at that time. And so here, this trip, it's, it's just another one of the trips that we were doing. And it, it was a good trip. And uh, I didn't take it. I just, I just, I just told Nora, I said, I'm just, I'm not going. Well, you just, you just didn't want just, to go, I'm I guess. That going. was what you were saying. It yeah. didn't please me. You understand? But now I didn't hear a word from God, don't go on the trip. It wasn't that. It's just, I'm having to work too hard to do this. Just don't have it in you, you know? And, uh, well, long story short, on that trip, uh, there were some weather events happened and, and, planes and mission planes and things like this and bad weather and ended up the plane that I probably would have been on crashed and hit the side of a mountain. Now, I don't know if that was all, you know, just orchestrated by God in some, you know, way. It wasn't spectacular. It's just you just don't do it. And I couldn't even say with absolute certainty that I would have been on that plane either because there were a number of planes involved in that, in that mission endeavor. But that was the plane that I probably would have been on I mean, for reasons. And uh, so, you know, just, just walking slow before God and not mm -hmm. getting out beyond your skis, so to speak. Right. Not getting ahead of yourself. But sometimes it's better to go slow. Yeah. God will never get mad at you for going slow. He, he, he wants you to go slow. Slow is better than fast. Now, when it's time to move, though, you've got to move. Yeah, he doesn't bless procrastination yeah, it, necessarily. It, I'm not talking about that kind of slow. But I'm talking about as you wait on God and as you feel out the things of God. Uh, so many people get in trouble by just moving too quickly. You know, you see people get in marriages they should not be in. You, you, they, they buy, they make purchases, they buy homes they shouldn't buy. They get, they get impulsive. They buy cars that strap them with, with, you know, things that they don't need to be strapped with. They just make decisions. Well, God will provide. I'm going to speak the word and God will provide. Well, maybe let him speak the word to you. <laughs> Prevent some of that stuff. We've never moved. We, in, in the whole time we've been married. Now, I'm not talking about every minor detail. But I'm talking about the big things. You know, house purchases and, you know, car purchases and decisions to do things. You know, start churches and things of that nature. Things that you make decisions about that are mm -hmm. serious. We've never one time ever missed God. 
ever. I mean, it's never happened, you know, and I thank God for that. Amen. You know, now little things, you know, like which, which potato peeler are you going to get? You know, that's not a big decision. Well, I would have liked the other one better. Well, who cares? See, so every little decision is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the big decisions of life. And, and there's a way that you can be led by the Spirit and not miss. Yeah. And, you know, it's so interesting there in those situations with the apostles that you were reading. And so many of the things that you're talking about here, the decisions that we've made, as I look back on that, it's like it seemed good. Mm -hmm. It seemed good. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I didn't. We had peace with it. Yeah. You know, you lose your peace. Now there's a, yeah, that's a, that's mm. a, a situation that you really need to, you know, you, you may be moving forward and you go forward and then you start losing your peace. Stop right there and take a estimation mm. of where you are and why you lost that peace because peace follow after peace. That's what the Bible well, scripture says. says that let peace be the final umpire yes yeah in your life uh, you, you know if, if you if you're watching a baseball game and the and the umpire says you're out you're out it it, it didn't well he might have missed it well hopefully they got replay <laughs> you know because what the umpire says is law well that's what god says about peace peace is law to you I mean, it is the absolute thing that you cannot violate. Mm. I don't care if every sign, every indicator, everything lines up favorably and you lose peace, don't do it. Period. You say, well, you know, I might miss the opportunity. Miss the opportunity. Miss it. Because if it's, if, if, if it's a good thing, I mean, God's probably wanting you to stop for a minute. It, it, may, it may come back. Yes, and you may be able to do Opportunity may something. come back, but it may come back in a better way. I remember I bought a car recently. Of course, that's nothing new, is it? <laughs> um, but I, I know that we, we worked on that deal on that thing, and it's like I just couldn't get right where I needed to be. And uh, I felt like in my heart, this was my car. I'm not talking about a car. I felt like it was my car. I, I felt that way, you know. And I felt like the Lord had indicated that it's, this is yours. But I couldn't get the numbers to come together. It just was, it just was not coming together. And I was not going to do what they wanted me to do. You say, well, you might lose the opportunity. Well, I'm losing it because I ain't doing that. You know, let her go. If you if you love something too much, you'll make a mistake. You got to be willing to walk away. And if you're not willing to walk away, the devil's got a ring in your nose. You got to be willing to walk off. Well, I was praying about it, and you know, what I was talking to the Lord about it. I said I thought that was mine. He said, Well, he said he said do this, and he gave me two or three things to do. And um, I called them, and long story short, it went back and forth a little bit. But I told them, I said, I'll do this. Well, this is all on the phone. They would text me, and they said, deal. I said, okay, we got it. But you, you got to go slow and let God prepare all the things for you. And there were other people trying to buy that car, but I got my deal, my deal. Now, so it's never, you know, you, you think maybe, well, I've lost it. Well, you're better off to lose it than you are to make a blunder. And if it comes back to you, then praise God. If it doesn't come back with you, there's a better one waiting on you. So you never, it's never over till it's over. Anytime that I feel like something has not come together in the way that that I wanted it to. I know 
that my God has something better for me. It's not like I've lost. I promise you there's a better opportunity coming. I, and I, I'm, I'm telling you now, 50 plus years of doing this, it's always that way. If there's something that you can't get to work out, don't fret. There's a better thing coming. I mean, there's a better, you lose a friend and you think, well, you know, I mean, you know, nobody wants to lose a friend, but sometimes not everybody who says you're, they're your friend or really your friend. <laughs> you know, they, it takes time to get friends. You can meet a lot of people quick, but it takes time to build friendships. I mean, it really does. And there are people who will weave in and out of your life and, and they'll be there a while and then they're gone. And, you know, it, it happens. And that's the nature of life. And, and, and nothing's forever. Nothing's forever. But there are some friends that are put there for a long, long time, you know. There's some that are. Um, but if you lose somebody that you, you know, were fond of for whatever reason, and I'm talking to somebody right now. I, I know. I know that. Um, you got to let it go. Now they might come back, but let me tell you, there may be some things that God's trying to do to make it where they can come back. Sometimes, folks, people got to repent of stuff. They got to get their life straightened out, and in in the conditions that maybe they're in right now. That wouldn't be a good relationship for you to have. Maybe they don't live right. Well, I like them. I really love them. I think they're great people. I know, but if they're not living right, they'll pull you down. You know, and, and, and you have to be willing to walk off. You have to be willing to walk away. You know, we're talking about the authority of the believer, but here I think we've got into a whole lot of being led by the Spirit, mm -hmm. you know. But, but the authority of the believer works when you're in the will of God. So it's not a disconnected topic. That's when that authority structure works for you. You got to be doing what God wants you to do the way he wants you to do it in the place where he wants you to do it and the time he wants you to do it. And all those pieces have to come together. There's some things that God wants you to do. And it may be out of timing. Maybe given a little more time, it may come together for you. And there's things that he may want you to do. You may be trying to do it in the wrong place. Or you may be doing it in the wrong way. So a lot of times these delays are to position you better. It's not to take it away from you. It's to get your position better. So it'll work better for you, not worse for you. And sometimes we get in a tizzy. What is a tizzy? Does anybody know what? A, you know, we get we get in a you know we get it in a tizzy, um, and it doesn't come to pass just the way we want it to. And we think, well, I've lost that forever. But sometimes you've not lost it. Delay is not no. Wait is not no. Did you know the Bible says that all? of the promises of God are yea and amen. You know what that means? If you pray in accordance with the word of God, which is the will of God, he never, ever, ever says no. Ever. Now, if you're praying outside his will, he may tell you no. But if you're praying inside his will, inside, inside his will for your life and inside the, the, the confines of this book, your covenant, he'll never tell you no. Well, that may be too big for me. Well, I mean, maybe you got to wait. You know, there's a famous line in, you know, the, the Schwarzenegger movie, I'll be back. See, you need to learn that. You need to put that in your vocabulary. You may not be able to do it now, but I'll be back. That was a better place for you to amen than you did. 
But I guarantee you, see, some of the things that you want to do, it's just not time. It's everything, all the conditions are not necessarily right for you. And, you know, over time, uh, you may find that as you get a little bit down the road from it, you find yourself, you don't even want it anymore anyway. So a delay is not always bad. It might be protection. And so, you know, you've got all these people that say, well, God said no. Well, he won't say no if you pray inside the, the, the will of God. He won't say no. That's a good place to say amen. Amen, Sister amen. Nora. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. You know, we, we've done our time in. Um, we went a little, probably a little over slightly. But, you know, I, I think these things are so important. You know, we just get up here and we talk. I'll tell you the truth. This is like, it's like turning on a faucet back here. It just comes out. I mean, just the stuff just comes out, you know. And uh, hopefully it blesses you because that's why we're here. And we don't, we, now we're ready, believe me. I mean, we're prepared to do what we need to do. We don't come unprepared. But we don't over-prepare either. We just allow it to happen. So we don't mind when we drift a little bit. We don't care. It's okay. Hopefully you don't mind either. But anyway, so we do it. But anyway, if you're out there and you're listening to me now, and maybe you're struggling with the will of God for your life, maybe you need to know what the next step is or which way to go. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you don't know Jesus, that's your next step. That is the absolute next step. Everything else pales by comparison to that one. If you don't know him or you say, well, I've, I've been born again, but I'm not living for the Lord. Well, that's where you got to start. You got to get to that issue right there. And all you have to do is pray a simple prayer. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to receive you back if that's the case. And you open your heart to him. And he's with wide open arms waiting on you. He will never turn you away. And he won't condemn you. You know, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God's not mad at you. He'll take you back. But you've got to open your heart to him. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you. I repent of my sins. I turn to you. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. Now, you know, if you prayed that prayer, I know you'd mean it. You'd never pray a prayer like that and not mean it. Let us know. The reason it's important to let somebody know is because with the mouth confession is made into salvation. You've got to tell somebody what you've done. That's what seals it in your heart. So let us know if there's a person around close to you. Tell them what you've done. But we want to know because we want to pray with you and rejoice with you over it because we love you. And uh, we care about you, don't we? Yes, we do. And we're so glad that you've been with us. <laughs> Tonight, we believe, and I, I really sense the Holy Spirit has led us into some things that are very important, and I believe it is a word in due season. Amen. Well, let's bless, our, bless them before we go. Father, we bless our friends right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let your favor, your, uh, your goodness, yes. just let it be realized, experienced, and enjoyed by them. And we thank you for blessing their life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joy to be with you. We love you.